Greetings, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Very good. My name is uh, Koten. I think uh, a lot of you know me and some of you probably don't. I've been a student uh, here at the Zen Center since uh, 2006. Um, and in that time, uh, I spent um, 10 years as the Tenzo, which is the cook. Um, and right now I'm, uh, I'm holding the duty as the, uh, the work leader, um, kind of in charge of all of the facilities uh, and, and landscaping and outside and things. Um, I've just been thinking that, you know, coming together like this since the, the uh, COVID outbreak and our, uh, our sheltering has been quite a special thing. And uh, we wouldn't have thought that that would be the case because we're not actually able to be together physically. But coming together like this in this virtual environment, I've found uh, has its own special, uh, it has its own special place. And it, it seems like uh, also this connection that we're having with, uh, with so many more people from outside uh, is, it seems like a much, uh, much uh, easier path for the for the dharma to be kind of touching many many people at the same time uh, and also i think that um what it's been doing especially for me and i know that i've heard others uh talking about how it's transformed their their personal space maybe their living space their house or you know just the room that they sit in because we we need to prepare this area uh we um maybe we uh we set our cushion out uh, maybe we clean the area a little bit and we organize it. We might light a, a candle uh, or something. Um, but we're doing something to make this the Zendo. And, you know, even though this is virtual Zendo, it's very, very real Zendo because what it does, this transformation that takes place, not only in, uh, in what, we're, uh, what our, our room is like or our house or living quarters are like, but also this transformation that takes place within ourselves, because it's the same thing that we do when we sit down to do zazen. We try to, um, we're going to organize uh, ourselves into the posture. Um, this, is, this is like setting our cushion out. This is like lighting the candle. Uh, we're, we're folding our legs. Uh, we're holding our mudra. We're making sure that we're upright. Um, and it is all kind of the same. Uh, I really... I've also kind of felt that, uh, you know, that this is kind of what it's done to, to my room. I have a small cabin. It's maybe you know, like 10 by 12 and everything is that cabin. Um, obviously I can, I can do many things around the Zen center, but that's like my personal space. That's like my little nest. Um, and so everything happens there. I sleep there. Sometimes I eat there. I read there. I study, I sit there, I work out there and it becomes everything. But with each of these different iterations of that cabin, you know, what, what is the transformation of that? And it is just what that activity is. What's the next activity that I'm going to do? So if I'm going to work out, maybe I need to set my weights out. Maybe I need to get, get a bench or something together. Or usually I probably have to clean some of my clothes off of the equipment so that I can do it. Um, but it's very real. And also this... Um, I think that bringing the camera into the room, because I've sat in my room many times, you know, I have the altar there uh, and it's been there, you know, throughout the time that I've been there, but it's, uh, it's taken care of m much in a much more, uh, there's a, a little more finesse going into it or maybe just, just more care going into it because uh, this is real. This is the real Zendo. Um, and I think that people can also feel the difference between just sitting by yourself in your room alone and sitting in front of a camera with, with other people there because the connection is very real. Uh, even though it is a virtual Zendo, or actually it's the, the, the way that we're coming together is virtual. The Zendo is very real. Um, so a couple of weeks ago when Roshi gave his talk, he, uh, he mentioned the fact that we're having a study group. And we do this on Tuesday nights. Um, this is something that's gone on for a long time at the Zen Center. Uh, 
in the fall and in the spring. Uh, now we're finding that this this format to come together at Zoom is is really quite quite nice for this because people can uh, uh, can get together you know after work without driving up here um, and we can talk about this. And what Roshi is saying is for us to read uh, in itself. It can be fraught for a student. It can be fraught with uh, with problems. We can have misunderstandings as we read, and that's why we have a teacher so that we can, as we have these different ideas that come up, different. Uh, it could be emotions. It could be a, a breakthrough that we have. We can we can bounce that off our teacher. We can talk to him, and see if that if we are seeing things clearly, or maybe we're not seeing things clearly. But to actually study a book and to study this is a book by um, well, it's on Dogen's uh, fascicles of the Shobagenzo. It's the deepest practice, deepest wisdom. And this is um, three fascicles from the Shobagenza with commentaries by uh, Kosho Uchiyama. And then the translation is uh, Daitsu Tom Wright and Shohaku Okamura. And they both add, uh, add their commentaries towards the end as well. It's very, very, uh, very interesting and very deep, but also um, studying it with others is helpful uh, because we can we can bring these ideas up. We can talk about them a little bit. So I thought I would go uh, go through a little bit of that today um, to open it up. Now, the one that we're reading right now, the the uh, fascicle is called uh, Makahanya Haramitsu, and this is very uh, this is Dogen's um, it's sort of Dogen's answer or Dogen's treatise on the uh, the Heart Sutra. And so what? Um, Dogen has always done, he's kind of pulled out these things that could be misleading or that he feels are not quite explained completely through, uh, you know, through the, the annals of Buddhism. And he puts his own spin on it. And in this, it's, it's quite interesting what, what, uh, what he does to this. So the, um, what I could do is just um, start out. I know we don't have a whole lot of time here today. So what I'm going to do is we'll probably just go through the first sentence, but I'm going to read the, um, the first paragraph um, just to, to get a setting. And then we can take that apart and, uh, and talk about a couple of items. So this is um, Makahanya Haramitsu. The time of Abhago Kiteshvara Bodhisattva, practicing profound Prajna Paramita, is, is the whole body clearly seeing the emptiness of all five aggregates? The five aggregates are forms, sensation, perceptions, predilections, consciousness. This is the fivefold prajna. Clear seeing is itself prajna. To unfold and manifest this essential truth, the Heart Sutra states that form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. And Dogen states, form is nothing but form, and emptiness is nothing but emptiness. Hence, there are the hundred blades of grass and the 10,000 things. So at the beginning of, of, our, of the Heart Sutra, the first line uh, states, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, practicing deep prajna paramita, clearly saw that all five conditions are empty. And we could see now what, um, what Dogen has done here is he has taken it and said, the time of Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva practicing profound Prajna Paramita is the whole body clearly seeing the emptiness of all five aggregates. And so this is this is what we've uh, what Dogen has done with the subject and with the object. So instead of um, instead of it being uh, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva practicing, it is the time of Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva practicing. And so what what he's done is he's made it about the instance and the action. So the instance being the time of, and believe me, we just we just studied uh, Uji, just that was the last fascicle that we that we read, and it was quite interesting that this in the first fascicle that that um, that Dogen wrote, uh, he starts out with this, uh, and it's it's uh, this 
his use of time and the way that he's treated time throughout his writings is very interesting. Uh, but the consistency of it in this kind of leads us in a, in a good direction. And I, I really like that. So it's about the instance and the action and the action being the practice. That's that practice of, of, uh, of prajna, uh, the deep wisdom. So, so about, um, and the practicing, it's changing the subject from, uh, from Avalokiteshvara or from, from you or from me to the, uh, to the whole of the Buddha Dharma, to the whole universe. I think uh, with this time, this is kind of a, an expedient means, uh, the time of, so the, it, what it reminds me of is the koan, uh, what was your original face before your parents were born? And what this, in, in this koan, it's always seemed to me that, that, that before your parents were born was extra. And I think that this is probably what Dogen would say as well, because the, um, our original face uh, probably has nothing to do with an original of just specific times. It, it is not uh, related to that time. It's just a convenient way to say before your parents were born. So it takes us out of that. And this is kind of what the Heart Sutra is doing, negating. So no eyes, no ears, no nose. And these are all things that we really know. This is a literal, the way that we would think of this literally in the Heart Sutra. And it's not really the way that it needs to be read. I remember um, years ago when Roshi was talking about this uh, and talking about the sutras, mainly how we chant and how we understand them, um, that the Heart Sutra is not something that we should grasp with our intellect. Now we have, um, there's ways that we, we uh, there are different filters that we can put on things with our intellect. We could put filters on with our emotions or just the, the maybe we could say the, the filter of the universe or no filter which would be um, from the Hara is where we understand it. But what Roshi said was, we don't try to understand with our intellect, with our thinking mind. We should wait and just let it wash over us, let it seep in through the back of our head. And this to me, it really, it really does speak to me because this is the thing that we just, we can't say. This is something that we can't approach, and we can't touch with our thinking mind. It's something that we have to experience. It's something that we have to feel, and it's that that action. And then uh, I think that that is a lot. <laughs> so the time of Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva practicing profound prajna paramita is the whole body clearly seeing the emptiness of all five aggregates. And as we, um, as we go to the commentary by Uchiyama on the whole body, it's simply the blending of, of subject and object. So the whole body is, is no subject and object or the coming together of subject and object. So it's, it's one, one. So no separation between subject and object. And uh, Uchiyama expresses this as all over all. And he has, he has that it's just written out, you know, all with the slash over all as if it was a fraction. And all over all is just, it's, it's one. And later on in the, in the text, he talks about um, in mathematics, even infinity over infinity is one. But it's not in Buddhism, in Zen, it's not the one that we think of in, in mathematics, the one as opposed to two or three. It's not a number among many numbers. It's just, it's just one. It's all, all over all. And I think that um, the Heart Sutra in its negation, because it's no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, on and on. In this, um, in this negating structure, it kind of points to the profound, I believe, in the mundane. Now, this is 
a way to take us out of our usual way of thinking of things. This is a cup and here's my nose and there's the door and take us to, um, to a deeper level. But reading the Heart Sutra literally is like insanity. So we we're like, how, how am I supposed to understand that? So what Dogen is reminding us is that there is also the mundane in the, in the, in the, pro, in the uh, profound. That form is form. Form is emptiness from the Heart Sutra. Form is form, that everything is exactly what it is. That he reminds us that um, even though that the Buddhist philosophy shows us or kind of urges us to think of things all holistically, all just, just as they are as one, uh, we also need to know that there's the truth of a spade is a spade. That this is an, a, a kind of an expedient and temporary name for things. But we have to be able to call these worldly dharmas something. I mean, how would we know to get out of the way of the bus? And the way, um, the way that we can manifest this whole body is just simply through our zazen. And so you might ask, what does that mean? So during our uh, study group last week, Roshi asked us the question. The question came out, you know, what do you do in zazen? And it's a scary question. And it's actually, as I wrote down here, it's actually kind of a dangerous question. And this question could be dangerous because of perhaps our misunderstanding of the Heart Sutra, or it could not, not necessarily a misunderstanding, but maybe taking it too literally. Because we may think that in Zazen, you know, nothing, everything is gone. But we know that that's not true. That's not our experience. And admitting that is hard sometimes, but we have to know that it's natural. That's our way. That's the human way. The um, Kosho Ushiyama's teacher was Kodo Sawaki. And Kodo Sawaki, when asked that question, uh, what do you do in Zazen? Or, you know, what is Zazen? And uh, I, was, I was very impressed by his answer. He said that, you know, I, I, it doesn't do anything. Zazen takes care of Zazen. Sawaki is thinking about the girl that he met on the street. And to me, this sh it shocked me at first to think that, well, that's kind of irreverent. But then also, it's, it's quite honest that, yes, thoughts come up when we're sitting. Um, they do for everyone. They have to. But what do we do with them? So that's kind of what I want to uh, talk about a little bit. Now, I've noticed that with me, many times when this is happening, Rosie said it's flurried mind. If you have the flurried mind, investigate that flurried mind with the flurried mind. And it's a very good practice. You know, I think that what... Um, also, the, the Kota Sawaki was pointing at is that uh, as I'm sitting and things are happening and it's, there's a lot going on and I think maybe I'm not doing very good zazen, if I look behind that, I can notice that I'm still breathing very regularly and I'm sitting very straight and I'm still holding the posture and I'm still actually holding that intent within my, uh, within my being. So it's, there's nothing missing. It's all still there. It's just flurried mind. It's not something to get rid of. Um, maybe it's not what we want, but it's what we have. It's what we have to deal with. So uh, I thought maybe what I would do is just say kind of what I do in Zazen. And this is by no means is what I always do in Zazen. This is a hard thing to come up with. And then maybe open it up and see. Hopefully some other people would have some insights on this as well. So, um, First, you know, as I'm uh, getting dressed, moving towards the cushion or towards the zendo, and now it's towards the cushion, we're in the same room. Just getting into the posture, feeling upright, alert, and open. It's free form, no direction and no intention. Just settling. Observe mind, body, and surrounding as one, not mathematical one. One includes sounds, temperature, thoughts, emotions. And this could be extra, but that's our expedient means. 
So uh, gentle, in, uh, gentle intention arises. So only intention with no object of intention. And what, what I, I mean by that, this is obviously it's something that's been learned. I was thinking about this this morning. It's not a natural thing. It's something I've learned. What does it feel like to hold intention with no object of intention? And this, to me, it, it, it feels kind of like um, the term, as we call holding all things as one toji. It's, it's readiness. You're ready in every moment for just what's there. We're not ready for a surprise or for the mundane, what we expect. We're ready for whatever is there. So it's, um, it feels like readiness. So holding all things equally is toji. So as thoughts arise, we notice only, but we'll leave them be. Certain expedient means, what do I mean by that? Can be, can be employed um, because at some point it's all gonna go to shit. We're gonna be sitting and then suddenly we realize that we just can't stop our mind. What do we do? Or we realize that we're falling asleep or we have a, you know, a pain that's just not, that's not letting us concentrate or our concentration is off or we just think that we're not doing what we should do. Well, then we just, we start over. We reset, set on the cushion. We reset our mudra. We breathe in, we breathe out and we feel the cushion and we start over, it's, it's going to happen 10,000 million times in our zazen, and it's all coming back to it. It's not just finding a spot that is like dead or a spot that is like clean laser focus and holding it there. Sometimes we can do that, but it's completely not the point, and it's probably detrimental, it can be. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to say before I open this up a little bit is, uh, I wrote this out, the, uh, the acupuncture needle of Zazen is a, uh, it's a poem by uh, Monk Wang Shi. Um, it's kind of really, really kind of hits the mark and it's hard, it's hard to say anything about it. You just have to listen to it. And all I wanted to do was the first four lines because the first four lines, I think I could have done this at the beginning. It kind of sums up what where, where I was going with the, with the Heart Sutra and the Zazen and this today. And it starts out as this, the essential function of all Buddhas, the functional essence of all ancestors is to know without touching things and illuminate without encountering objects. So with that, I think uh, I'd like to open it up if there are people that have some questions, but what I'd really like to, to uh, hear is kind of what we do in Zazen. And you know, this is a nice, comfortable, safe space for us. We know that this is, you know, this can be, it feels delusional. Oh, I'm thinking this, or I'm trying to do that. But truly that's our process and it's an important part of our process. So are there are any, any comments or questions? I, I couldn't agree more, Kotem, with your experience. Uh, recently, uh, falling asleep has been, uh, I would say, chronic. And uh, taking from Roshi that uh, a thought always occurs, but uh, thinking is uh, knitting together a series of thoughts and just accepting whether it's thoughts or falling asleep as complete and perfect, resetting and going back to uh, that zero point you mentioned. It, it turns into that, that is our activity of Zazen, returning. Yes, yes, very much so. Sometimes it seems that uh, maybe a definition of enlightenment is approaching enlightenment mm. through the door of delusion. Mm. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Coach Han. This is Annie. Uh, it's so good to see you. Uh, I'm thinking about, like right now I'm only doing Zazen in the morning, uh, which is like my least favorite time to do Zazen because I have like a terrible caffeine addiction and <laughs> like it's before coffee. So it's like as crabby as I am all day, like the 30 minutes before <laughs> I have coffee and I just see my mind is like irritable, angry, um, more so than the rest of the day and very, very like busy with thoughts. Um, there's like very little settling, but I love the uh, Koto Sawaki uh, koan you shared and that like Zazen is still doing zazen, whatever, like, Annie is doing, because I do, it's, no matter how cranky I am <laughs> during zazen, it's, like, a different morning after uh, than, than when I don't do it. Um, yeah, so, thank you. Anyone else? Hi, Koten. Yen Zen here. Yen Zen. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, in response to the question you asked, I use the Heart Sutra during my Zazen. <laughs> I am needing a roadmap sometimes so that um, when my mind goes, I have a, a, a map to follow when it comes back. So I'm not left in a kind of a, a lost place. So I just take eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and the first thing I do is um, focus on what I'm seeing. So when I disperse and I come back, then ah, rather than flounder, I, I, I go to my seeing. So I'm just following the steps of the Heart Sutra. But when I disperse from that and I come back, then I have the seeing, but then I focus on the sounds the refrigerator that crows out the window. And then after that, I go to smell, or sometimes I can smell the incense, or just feeling it extra sensitively my breath. And then the fun part is the, the taste. So I just feel the inside of my mouth, my tongue against the palate, and just hold that sensation inside now, and then when when we when I disperse from that, it, sometimes the period's up by then. But um, then I go to my body and adjust my mudra, feel feel sensation in my body, make sure I'm my posture's going well. So it's a roadmap. It's it, it's not a, um, a a predictable course, but it's just that. I found it helpful for me to use the Heart Sutra. And then I learn more and more about what is seeing, what is hearing. Anyway, just offer that. I had a question, uh, maybe I misspoke, uh, but the question was uh, how, when I said that, uh, that Zazen could be dangerous, but no, I, I said that um, the question could be dangerous. So this question, ask, asking someone, asking the practitioner, what do you do in Zazen? Um, could be dangerous just because to our psyche, we don't, uh, perhaps we don't want to admit, you know, the struggles that we have in Zazen. We might think that uh, as a Zen student, we're supposed to be very calm and very organized and, you know, very focused. 
at all times. And it's just not, it's just not true. So the, da the danger, or, you know, maybe it's, it's not really danger, but maybe the courage of, you know, admitting that is what I was alluding to on that. Hi, uh, my name's Janet. And um, thank you for this morning. And also, Edward, I loved listening to your process. It's beautiful, beautifully shared. There's just a couple things I thought would be nice to share. Roshi told me a long, long time ago that the posture itself has its own effect. And I find that to be really true. It's like it has a muscle memory so that when I take the posture, it's like the first step of coming home. And, and when I practice, often I will start with just noticing my body. Um, sometimes I start with my feet and the pressure that I feel of my legs on the floor, feeling my seat. And, and so when I feel like I'm a little bit there, then I'm basically just paying attention to my breath. But the thing that's come up for me is that notion of um, no clinging, no aversion. I have lately found that the best time for me to sit is when my mind is going nuts. It's just the best time and the most profound time. And so for me, it's like the work for me or the practice for me is to allow what's there without pushing it away or hanging on to it and making it into a temple of its own. Um, and, and the thing like what Edward was talking about, the things that are the anchors, and for me, it's just the physical feeling of the breath. So that's how I practice. Thanks. Thank you. Maybe that's enough. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Koten. Thank you, Koten. It's good to see everyone. <laughs> Lots of faces. Agata. Yeah, yeah. Where, where are they? Hi. Thank you, Koten. <laughs> you slept in the house? 